Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending the Deep Dive for Nats. Uh, my name is Colin Sullivan. I'm product manager at Nats. Here's Wally Quevedo, engineer. And uh, just a show of hands, who's already using Nats today? All right, good, good. What about in production? All right, OK. okay. So uh, I'll let Wally go ahead and get mm -hmm. started with the deep dive. I'll chime in here and there. And then uh, at the end, we actually have Derek here, creator of Nats, to answer questions. Okay. Uh, thank you for attending the deep dive to Nats. Um, for this is about the evolution of the Nats project. To give you a, a brief history of the Nats project, um, it's an eight-year-old uh, project already. First commit was in two, uh, 2010. First release was part of uh, Cloud Foundry in 2011, it got open source uh, with the open sourcing of uh, Cloud Foundry. Then it got rewritten into Go in 2012. Also in October, uh, it reached the V1 version of the NAT server in 2017. And finally this year, uh, we joined the CNCF uh, in March 2018 as an incubation uh, project. So 2018 is a really big year from NATS. If you look at our Git history, you can see that uh, there have been significant contributions and into the uh, to the server, and the biggest spike of commits and from uh, several uh, PRs are landing into master. So the project evolved quite a bit uh, this year, and uh, there were uh, three uh, different releases for the V1 series of the of Nats. We had releases of uh, features such as a graceful disconnection from the clients, uh, we call it the drain mode, the no, no echo mode to stop uh, receiving your own messages on, on sus your subscriptions. Uh, there were enhancements to the permissions such as allow and deny, uh, hot configuration reload by sending the hop signal, major uh, internals overhaul um, with the outbound architecture for high fan out uh, performance improvements, and also uh, uh, improvements to the uh, sublist uh, cache. And uh, for the V2, which is the, the big, uh, uh, well, the big uh, major, major version from the server now, there are many uh, interesting features, uh, such as the, the related to security and, uh, and better uh, multi-tenancy use cases, such as the, uh, we call it the end keys, which are ED25519 based uh, public private keys for identity. You have accounts isolation that uh, we, you can call them as like containers, but for messaging, has uh, features to be able to share uh, data by using uh, imports and exports, uh, gateways uh, to be able to create super clusters, uh, like cluster of, of clusters, and decentralized, decentralized authorization by using uh, JWTs, so no longer having a single static configuration from the server, instead using JWTs and uh, the configuration is um, not only from a single source. And some uh, minor improvements to be able to check the configuration, whether it's correct, and also to improve their um, operations, such as the graceful, graceful shutdown using the lame duck mode. Um, all of this together is, uh, uh, is so that we can achieve uh, the vision that we have a uh, of scenario for, uh, for NATS, so that as a global utility to be able to uh, connect uh, uh, devices and uh, services. And this is what the maintainers have been uh, up to uh, all of this year. So in this talk, I'm gonna share about the latest features uh, from NATS that are coming soon in the next release. I'm gonna give uh, some demos of these features and we'll leave some time uh, at the end for the Q&A of uh, questions. Uh, so first I wanna start with the graceful uh, disconnect, which is the drain mode. This is a client's uh, site um, uh, enhancement. There is no uh, changes for, to the server for this. So this allowed you, it's a new API call from the clients. It's uh, called drain that allows to the clients to be able to detach from the cluster uh, gracefully. Uh, and bef uh, usually uh, before drain, you would use the close connection to try to flush all the internal buffers from the server for the client. And uh, that would, that, and after that you would terminate the TCP connection, but that would also cause uh, dropping some of the messages. So the way that drain works is that it uh, announces to the server that it's no longer interested into the subjects, uh, but it still gives you some time to uh, process the messages that 
has, have already been delivered by the server um, to the client. And in, it is, uh, there were no changes to the uh, client protocol. It's using uh, more of the protocol. It's using the on-sub protocol to, share, to announce to the server that uh, to stop, uh, to announce to the server to stop uh, delivering messages on a certain subject. And this, uh, you're familiar with the reconnection logic uh, from NATS. Uh, there are uh, the closed, it's a terminal state. Um, before, I, if, um, before reaching the closed state, which is like the client will uh, give up trying to connect to an, a server, it will try to reconnect a number of times, uh, flipping from between the reconnecting and disconnected states. And also, uh, with the drained mode, uh, this means that uh, there is a new state that is called the draining state. During this draining state, it's also the client will reach the terminal state of the closed connection, but it will process any in-flight uh, messages. So the way this works is by, let's say, uh, from another client, deliver a message to, this, uh, uh, to another client. Uh, it could be a queue subscription, for example. The client that is going to become uh, drained announced to the server via unsub that to stop receiving messages. And after it, uh, it finishes uh, processing all those messages, then it disconnects. But as soon as the unsub is uh, sent to the server, then the rest of the following messages are sent to the other clients um, that can receive messages on that subject. Yeah, so this is the, the primary use case is for a really smooth transition uh, when you're using load balance queue subscribers. So a load balance queue subscriber has your subscriber as part of a group, and the server randomly sends messages between each of these subscribers, providing a layer seven load balancer. In the past, when you wanted to downscale, you had to turn one of these subscribers off. You disconnected. Any messages that were in flight could be lost, causing your application to have to resend that message. With the drain mode, it provides a very graceful way to do that by unsubscribing and then processing the rest of the messages before you exit your application. Uh, ensuring that uh, you, know, you lose as minim the minimal number of messages as possible. Ideally, you know, when TCP is working fine, you won't lose any. So uh, this is an example of uh, using the drain API, um, also the close API. I uh, have a handler, signal handler, so that to this process you can send either the quit signal, uh, kind of like Nginx, so that it can gracefully uh, close the, the connection. And by sending the term signal, uh, it will uh, just close the TCP connection uh, right away. Um, something important to highlight here is that use the drain mode works asynchronously. So in case you wanted to uh, exit uh, the process as soon as the connection is closed, you still have to use the close handler, and that and and once uh, it reached to detect that it has reached the uh, closest state, and from there you can have the logic to uh, either recreate the connection or maybe just exit the process. Uh, here's an example of um, the top left corner. There is a client sending many requests uh, per second, and we have sent the termination signal to one of the queue subscribers that was res responding to that subject. And because we sent the termination signal, which causes, uh, uh, sends close, calls close in that, for that queue subscriber, then some of the requests uh, were dropped, as you can see. Uh, in comparison, uh, we're using drain. We'll be sending a different signal quit, which is what I defined in the handler, to the same queue subscriber. And you can see that it trapped the signal, but there were no any, there were any, any requests uh, dropped whatsoever. So uh, all the requests were processed, and then the process exited. From the server side, there is also an enhancement to be able to gracefully uh, shut down the node. This is the lame dog mode. Uh, this can be triggered by sending the user to signal that we, this will make the server slowly disconnect the clients that we're connecting to it. This helps uh, avoid the thundering herd issue by uh, slowly migrating the traffic from the server to letting the clients to they reconnect to another one. So yeah, one issue we ran into and we heard of people running into is when you have tens of thousands of connections or hundreds of thousands of connections and they're using TLS, that TLS handshake is, is incredibly CPU intensive because you're, you're doing cryptography, right? 
So what would happen is somebody would shut down an at server and all the clients would go over to a new server and that, that server would get CPU bound. Even you know, with eight cores, you would still get CPU bound just from the sheer volume of connections that are incoming and the amount of TLS handshake that you're doing. So we, we made this as a, we created this feature as a way to slowly migrate clients over to mitigate this issue. So in this demo, you can see that, again, there are a couple of queues subscribing, receiving the request from a, a number, I think, of 20 uh, requesters. And by sending user two signal to the server, the, which is the seed server in this case, the other server was discovered. And uh, the clients start to reconnect to the other one. But the one on the corner, the client in the corner is not dropping any requests. Then everything went, uh, well, one request in the end. But that was OK. Very uh, decreases the uh, failed request a lot. Um, another significant feature that made into the NATS uh, version 2, uh, Edge version, is are the gateway. It's the gate gateway which uh, allows you to create super clusters. This is uh, uh, allows you to create a global uh, NATS network. It's based on a very novel spline based technology. The queue subscribers are aware by using the uh, round trip time to be able to know the coordinates of whether they should be the ones to handle a, re a request. Yeah, so, so this is actually a really cool feature. So you, you network these clusters together using our uh, creating super clusters. Internally, we call them gateways. And you can have queue subscribers. So we just demonstrated the queue subscribers that where the server will randomly send messages to either subscriber or however many subscribers you have. Well, now, if they're on different gateways, you have a preference for the local queue subscriber. So that means if I have a service that's performing something for me and it's local, let's say I'm in Japan and I'm connected to AWS, it'll use the Singapore service. And if something, and let's say I've got another one in New York, if I have an application in New York, it'll use the New York service. But if any one of those goes down, so let's say the Singapore service goes down, then the application in Japan will start using the service in New York as a backup. So it's a great way to geolocate your own services that are queue subscribers anywhere in the world, get the best latency, yet still have failover. Yeah, in this example, we have uh, three different clusters that are, have uh, inbound and outbound connections by, by, by the gateways. Uh, one is in Amsterdam, another in New York, another in Bangalore. And in terms of the configuration, you have a new uh, stanza under the gateway. You have to define what is the, no the name of the cluster that, to, because, uh, well, do you have to de define the name of the cluster and also the explicit list of the connections of the remote uh, endpoints. There's a new port that has to be open in case, uh, here we're defining 5.2.2.2. And uh, just to give you a, a demo of the basic pop-up functionality using gateways, uh, at the top, we have the one in Amsterdam, a Telnet client connecting uh, another to New York. At the bottom is Bangalore. Uh, there are two subscriptions of the hello subject. Then the client from Bangalore at the bottom is sending a hello world and is received by the other uh, two clusters in the remote uh, data centers. You can see the public IPs that are advertised from the gossip are different in the uh, three examples. And to show you as well the way that queue subscribers work under this uh, topology. We have a, a couple of subscribers, queue subscribers, that are connected to that uh, Amsterdam data center. They are receiving the request from another client that is also connected to the Amsterdam data center. The one at the bottom is connected to the New York uh, uh, cluster. So in case we kill one of the queue subscribers, the other remaining queue subscriber is the one that is still handling the requests. And, but when you will kill that remaining queue subscriber, then the only one, the, the one at New York, is the one that starts receiving the traffic, kind of like a disaster recovery scenario. And there were no uh, request drops at, at all. Well, right now, because they're all killed. Also, a very cool feature, uh, it's the, are the accounts isolation, uh, which is like containers for messaging. Uh, they allow you to share data between accounts and segment uh, yeah, the, 
users uh, on their different accounts. We uh, are naming uh, uh, the subjects that um, are able to uh, receive a request, kind of like RPCs as uh, services, and just a uh, pure data flow uh, that we call them, uh, are calling, um, we're calling them streams. Yeah, and so accounts are, they're a great way to isolate your communications by organization. You can do it by geography, by organization, however you want to set it up. But if you have two clients that are connected using credentials in the same account, they can communicate. But two clients using even the same name of the credentials in different accounts won't be able to communicate. So this introduces multi-tenancy in NATS. It allows you to, to bifurcate your technology from the business-driven use case. In the old days, um, you had data silos, and that was driven by software requirements and hardware requirements. That no longer exists in the cloud, but you still want to sometimes isolate data, right? You want to isolate your clients. This provides a secure way to do that, and it also makes it easier on operations, because they only have to maintain one NATS deployment, not a NATS deployment for every context you want to isolate. So um, accounts are also decentralized in that you can have administrators for different accounts operating on the accounts, and the accounts um, can share data, but only when the two accounts mutually agree that data can be shared. So we have secure streams and services. You can export streams and services. A service is request reply, so that's your, your uh, certificate service, that's maybe where's my, my geo, where's my, what's my IP, whatever you can think of, but that's the communication that goes back and forth. We have streams that um, are a stream of data. And what happens is when an account exports a stream and another account imports a stream, only then will the data flow. And that allows you to decentralize the administration of accounts. Uh, so important to highlight that is that uh, in order to support this, the clustering protocol uh, was uh, uh, reworked. So uh, it is uh, not compatible with the V1 version. So you cannot connect a V2 cluster with a V1 uh, cluster. Although the client protocol is the same. That one is the, there are no changes. Right. Uh, Absolutely no changes to the clients. And we hated to break the protocol. We did. We made it so long without changing the protocol. But we had to change the server to server protocol for this. Yeah, this a uh, couple of snippets of how uh, the uh, clustering protocol looks like. You can see now the what used to be um, with an outside of the account now becomes a part of a global account, and the protocol is uh, quite different. So uh, yeah, we have uh, the services and stream definitions. Uh, services at uh, RPC endpoints, as Colin mentioned, and the streams just uh, data flow between accounts. And, but again, from the client perspective, you don't have to, there are no API changes uh, required. And to the, for the clients, these are still just subjects they publish and subscribe to. So from the client perspective, they don't even really know about accounts, except maybe at connect time. This is an example uh, configuration for the accounts in the server. Here we're defining uh, both the end keys, which is the, uh, for the identity of that user, but they also, it's compatible, still, you can use it with the uh, classic username uh, and password functionality. This is a bcrypt uh, password. Here is how we are defining that the Synadia account is exporting a stream named cloud.network status, and also a service that is private.devstats, and is sharing, to the, sharing that with the CNCF, CNCF account. Then there is a CNCF account that has a couple of users, Alice and Bob, as a password be encrypted, and it is importing from the Synadia account a subject uh, called cloud.network status, and it's mounting that on, under the Synadia.streams uh, prefix. So you will have to publish to the Synadia.streams um, cloud.network status uh, to receive the messages. Then there is an import for a service called private.devstats and is mounting that on the Synadia services uh, dot uh, dev stats. Uh, something very cool about the way that this the data sharing works is that the request response is uh, completely anonymous. So you're, you're familiar with the way that the request response uh, works in Nets. It uses uh, ephemeral subjects and you need identifiers 
uh, within the same uh, a single account. So you can st still you can see the uh, inbox and the unique identifier for that particular request. But once that a request uh, traverses to another uh, subject, um, another account, uh, subject namespace, it becomes transformed and anonymized into a different uh, subject so that the receiver of the original request it is not aware of what it was the original subject that was used for making the request. So uh, that uh, really helps with the iso uh, isolating uh, the subjects, a different uh, unique identifier. And you can see at the bottom that it still receives the request from the response from that request under the same subject where it sent it. Um, but the, there are uh, end keys and the JWT keys are the uh, core pieces for, uh, well, two of the big features for the security that we have. Uh, so, yeah, a couple of the new features we have are, are end keys and we alluded to this previously at KubeCon in, in, um, earlier this year, but we've got end keys, it's a NAT's identity. It's an ED25519 key that's made easy. ED25519 keys are, are really fast. They're very resistant to side channel attacks. And then you can sign and verify with them. So we've set up the NAT server to be able to accept. So we've set up the NAT server so that when a client connects, it sends a nonce, which is a random series of bytes that are salted. And what the client does is sign this nonce with its private key sends it back to the server, and the server verifies it with the client's public key. What's really cool about this is the NAT system never has to access or store your private keys ever, which, is, which, which gives you uh, many advantages in administrating uh, a zero trust system. Um, this is uh, an example of the flow of authenticating um, using the uh, end keys and JWT functionality now, you can see that in the info protocol, you get a nonce. And the client library then takes this nonce uh, and is using, it's going to use one of its private uh, end keys to sign and send a signature as part, as part of the connect uh, payload. And there's also a JWT uh, that is uh, passed to the server in order to, uh, for its identity. So the JWTs, uh, well, yeah, represent the identities for a NAT uh, user. They can be uh, represent a user, accounts, cluster, or a server. Uh, they contain a number of fields. Um, are important is that are the permissions of uh, what are the subjects that it can, um, it can publish or subscribe, and also some limits um, and expiration. This is uh, an example of JWT that expanded. It looks like this. You can see there's a private claim named Nets, where you define that this a particular user can publish on the public uh, wildcard subject, but it is not able to subscribe, and it's not able to subscribe into the private dot, uh, wildcard. And, really. and this has been signed by the account, so you know that it's the user who says it is, and it's from the account who says they are who they are. Uh, Another uh, enhancement that building on top of all this technology are the uh, system events. So now the, the servers, they have their own account for sending to each other events about the system. And it, you can define a, account just a, a system account for the servers. And then you can use that a system account to be able to monitor uh, through nets. And so besides the monitoring endpoint, you can also get now different events about the system. Um, uh, through the, uh, the sys account. And in this case, we can see that the server that is in Bangalore have this certain uh, version and has a, using this amount of memory for, and so far has a 400 connections uh, connected uh, to it. And you wanna cover the... Oh, new features that are coming up in the next mm -hmm. year are, we, we've gotten a lot of requests as people are moving to the cloud to, to integrate with other messaging solutions. So we've got someone that's really interested in us developing something with MQ series. And uh, more people that are interested in us developing some sort of bridge with Kafka. So that's something to look forward to. 
we'll have data at rest encryption and NAT streaming. We've got Project Jetstream, which is NAT streaming version two. We've taken a lot of the things that we've, we've seen people run into using NAT streaming and, and other streaming products as well, and we're learning from that and we're developing Jetstream. We're going to have native MQTT support coming up. MQTT is ubiquitous, it's, it's everywhere. So NATs being so lightweight, and the NAT server can even run on a Raspberry Pi, makes sense that we would integrate with that protocol. So we're gonna have native support in the NAT server for MQTT. We're gonna have WebSocket support as well. And then we're looking into expanding out into IoT with first class support with uh, micro microcontroller clients. And also, uh, all contributions are always welcome. And uh, you can just contribute by uh, fixing the bug, uh, just um, clarifying the documentation, or maybe presenting something at, at a meetup. So uh, just let us know. And so we, we actually have Derek Collis in here, the creator of Nats, uh, who can come up and answer any questions. If you have any really, really hard questions, he's the guy to ask. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Derek's been doing this a really long time. Any questions? Yes. Well, the question is about NAT streaming and Jetstream. So Jetstream, just so we're all on the same page, is still kind of in design. What we're doing is we've gathered a tremendous amount of feedback around people who have used NAT streaming, people who have used Kafka, things they like, things that they wish were a little bit better. Um, and so what we have continually heard was is that um, they like how lightweight NAT streaming is, that it's you know philosophically aligned with NATs but it feels like you're using two different products all the time when you're using NATs and NAT streaming. And why isn't it just that you can create a, a log of messages from normal NATs publishers, right? And then create a playback that's playing those things back. And so we're looking at that. Um, clustering, by the way, is very hard um, when it's a distributed state problem, especially an ordering problem. Um, and so we're trying to do better at that. Our first attempt was good, I think. Um, but I think we can do a lot better and keep that philosophical component being very easy, you know, just kind of work. So even the, the encryption stuff and the authentication stuff that uh, Wally and Colin were talking about, um, you know, the line in your code that you're writing says Nats Connect and it used to say URL. Now it says Nats Connect URL slash user credentials and points it to a file. And that's it. But what's happening underneath the covers is, is that we dynamically create callbacks that load these things, wipe the memory every time you connect and reconnect. So we're trying to make a lot of these things very sophisticated, but easy from a developer and an operation standpoint. Um, we care deeply about our users and our customers. So you're not going to see a, oh, that stream's dead, you know, m you know move over type stuff. Um, but we do believe that there's some compelling things in Jetstream. And I've told the team that uh, I don't want to be um, handcuffed by Stan, Stan's what I named the first one. Uh, I want us to really think you know, outside the box and bring something to the, the ecosystem that is beyond compelling. So we, we're still taking our time trying to figure it out. Any others? You guys gotta have some good questions. I know everyone's tired though. <laughs> yes? So the, the question is um, the decoupling between producers and consumers and the notion that NATS uh, protects itself at all costs, right? It's a very resilient system in that it's very selfish about itself, um, which actually is a, a really good tenet from my perspective of um, predictable distributed systems. Does the supercluster technology kind of help that? So um, NATS is, is an overlay technology. So back in the 90s, um, there was a transition from products I used to work on at TIPCO and Colin and, and others from the team were there as well 
from uh, UDP broadcast, unicast, and multicast to TCP IP. And the reason was is that inside of the network elements, when you actually looked inside of like a Cisco router, everything was outside the fast path except TCP IP, right? So you've seen a lot of these overlay networks because they actually perform better unless you have a massive fan out. And multicast is, a, is an administration nightmare. So um, NATS is an overlay network. So if you have a publishing rate that's coming inbound and the consumer can't keep up, it doesn't matter how many links, hops, and everything in between, it's just going to, we're going to cut it off. Now, when you look at how the servers actually fan out, right, um, superclusters and, and gateways obviously allow you to have more components working very efficiently. What superclusters were specifically designed for was a global scale technology where uh, round trip time and intersgraph propagation were optimized. So right now, clusters uh, propagate all intersgraph, meaning I say I, I'm listening, listening to Foo, everyone in that low, small cluster uh, knows about that. And Gateway technologies, we actually don't share that, right? Because you could have millions of accounts and your account's over on the West Coast and someone else is on the East Coast. And if we're just going back and forth nonstop telling each other about what you guys are interested in, but you'll never talk to each other, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And so it has a spline-based technology where it has inbound, outbound connections per server. So it's a full mesh graph but it actually uses a lot less socket connections, and it doesn't have a single point of failure where there's one selected leader in the cluster to get to the other side. Um, and what we'll do is we do optimistic sends, and then the other side can prune that very quickly based on account interest or subject interest. And it also has the ability to, when we get into a degenerative case where the pruning is actually generating more traffic than if we just told you what we were interested in, we can switch to perfect knowledge mode on the fly. So. Anybody else? Just, you had one earlier. Yeah, I heard the research that they had a question on the version that they're giving out. Mm-hmm. So what are some of the use cases they're trying to solve for the coordination of the packaging network? Sure. So, so the question is, w tell us about the, the vision of Connect Everything, essentially. Um, it's a great question. Uh, what I've seen throughout my career with two major technologies that, for the most part, just involve humans, which was the web, came up around 94, and the global cellular network. Even the people in the business at the time that said, oh, the World Wide Web's gonna be the greatest thing since sliced bread, and I was one of those people, had no way of understanding that we would be here today and the opportunities that existed just by being connected. That's essentially all that happened. They were just being connected. And we've got about 4.5 billion people online, maybe about 5.8 with, you know, if you look at 2G type uh, cell connections and stuff. Um, most estimates have the number of digital system services or devices at around 75 billion by 2022. And so what we think the massive, you know, uh, opportunity is, is doing the first wave of, okay, no more deck net, you know, token ring, TCP IP, let's standardize on one. And then let's connect everything together. But we have to do it securely. We have to have isolation, but then we want to promote secure sharing because we think the opportunities for that are just gonna be mind-boggling, things that we can't even understand. But we've seen some amazing messaging and communication technologies, but they always exist in silos. Even in companies that say, we're all in on blank, whatever that is, you go inside and you go, well, how many blanks do you have? And they go, well, 40. You know, we got a silo over here. It's kind of like the database thing. And so we're trying to promote this notion of always on digital dial tone, geo-aware, single URL, every cloud provider, edge technology, all the way down to um, the smallest uh, type endpoint devices, um, that's just always there and it always works and it's a trusted utility. It's a global communication utility for anything that's digital. And that's really ambitious, I understand that. Um, but that's okay. Uh, you know, I think we, the team's been working really hard for last year. Um, we turned the lights on, we're all tired and crossing our fingers. Um, but we know it's just the beginning. But we do believe these opportunities where all of a sudden there's so many resources that you can connect to and either have data streams that you'd want to share out, or services, right, where you will take requests from the outside. Um, we think there's some, some amazing opportunities that come from that. So that's kind of the, the, the gist behind the connect everything. Any others? Yes. So the, the question was MQTT uh, support in, in the server. Um, and Colin actually 
I went over it a little bit. It was on the slide. Yes, we are committed to it. Um, we believe that the opportunity for connecting everything exists further out towards the edge than more going back into um, the clouds. Not saying we're not doing that. We just did that. We just launched the product, actually GA'd it today, so it's open. Um, but we believe the, the massive opportunity exists there for telemetry, sensor type data, command and control, eventing, things like that. Um, we love NATS, as you guys all know. We've got our t-shirts on and our stuff. Um, but we also are realistic in terms of what's out there today. And so there's two things that we are going to do. We will allow um, native MQTT clients. Uh, my game plan right now is to go all the way up to 5.0 SN version, which has the compression tricks and things like that for the sensor networks. But also the 3.3 clients, which are the most prevalent, can connect directly into a GNETS D server and have it work seamlessly between itself and then all the other NATS clients. Um, and so we're, we're excited about that. Um, we're going to be pushing on that. Uh, it's no small feat, and it also, if you are aware of MQTT, uh, they have multiple QoS levels, right? They have Fire and Forget, like NATS Core. They have at least one semantics, and then I think they do have exactly once, at least as a protocol bit. Um, and so what's going to happen with that support and Jetstream, right? They're all going to be kind of, kind of, you know, it's all part of the same vision, right? So they're not independent things that we're developing. We're looking at both of those. The other one is, is that we've noticed that it's not only um, low level C at the microcontroller level anymore, right? There's some other languages that are coming up and I specifically have been watching MicroPython and CircuitPython as development environments that seem very popular. And so we're gonna write an extremely lightweight and performant um, MicroPython client for NATS that we're gonna try to embed into that and hopefully that'll be coming uh, soon and will be embedded on microcontrollers uh, that, that people want to um, you know, enable. Not sure when, but we are going to do it. It will be next year sometime. My, ho my hope is it's first half. I think we can do that. Um, but I'm always optimistic. And team always tells me I usually, you know, too optimistic. Any others? Yes. Um, I think we actually do. We have a you know, code of conduct and we have a governance piece that's in a separate repository that's like an umbrella repository for all of it because we have a lot of repos with clients and servers and stuff. So absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of the uh, CLAs. So I think CNCF allows you to do a CLA or a sign it and, you know, types of things. So if you just say minus S on your git commit, we're, we're good from, from our perspective. Um, we were... Before uh, considering joining the CNCF, um, when I originally wrote it, I made it MIT. So we're Apache 2 now, but we're, you know, we're, we've always been free as in beer. It's, uh, you know, do with it what you want. So. Yes? Uh, so the question is, with the global uh, communications utility, what is the relationship with the um, telephony operators around the world and such? Right. So right now, uh, NATS is, uh, all it requires is TCP IP. In the future, we are, we're looking very closely at um, the development of QUIC into HTTP 3, which essentially moves away from TCP IP back into um, UDP, UDP Unicast, which is back a long time ago is, is things, I did reliable Unicast on UDP for TIPCO, so I remember that fondly. Um, so what I mean by that is, is that it doesn't matter the substrate underneath the covers. So that being said, uh, NGS, which is the global utility that we launched, um, we are currently the only operator, but by design, it's supposed to be a federated model, meaning that we can easily see other people coming in, whether it be cloud providers or telecom operators, and say, we want to run some servers that serve our customers very well. But the goal from the original design was is that you as a user can connect to any server, Sanadia server, Verizon, Google, whoever might be running those uh, in the future, and your system just works. Right? We don't want to have to go through the AT&T, Verizon, you know, not being able to talk together way back when, when it first came out. So. Um, so right now, we, we have no bearing on the physical substrate. 
That being said, we are, since we're looking at more of the very low level um, microcontroller sensor type networks where they might be battery powered and stuff, they don't want you setting up massive TCP IP connections and draining the battery. So I've been investigating stuff. I don't know, uh, I don't have any answers, you know, but we're looking at short throw, graph technology with the Bluetooth stuff, LoRa, you know, those types of things. Um, and so we're gonna kind of try to figure our way through that. Um, but right now there's no physical substrate uh, requirements for NATS, just a TCP IP stack. Sure. Yes. Uh, so the question is, what's the thinking on NATS plus other messaging systems, whether it be Kafka or MQ series? Um, most of the team is uh, we're not very well known outside of maybe the NATS ecosystem, um, but uh, the team has over 100 plus years of experience designing these systems. So people from like telcos and Wall Street and Fin Services know of us. And so they keep coming back and saying, what do you have now? What do you have now? And we're starting to see companies wanting to do mixes. So the pendulum seems to always swing between best of breed to all in one. Um, and so we're getting a lot of people saying, hey, could you coexist with an MQ series? Could you coexist with a Kafka? And the reason I think people like that is because NATS is not only easy to develop against, it's extremely easy to operate. One of our core tenants is, is that it self-heals itself. It puts itself back together. It gossips to the clients where the new servers are so that you don't have to be relying on DNS or and, you know, another type of IP discovery stuff. So out towards the edges, you have these very large companies that want to move faster and they have requirements that kind of look like those tech, but if they, they feel almost like before cloud technology where they put in a ticket and they have to wait four weeks before they get anything to move forward. Um, so last time we were in New York, we said, well, why don't we just set up right now? And I think we had 30 minutes of problems with the firewall to get in and out of just the company. Once that was done, it was about four minutes and their whole system was set up for them. So people like that and like that they can experiment and play. And then they realize that if they want to, they can bet on it in production. I mean, that's, it's not perfect software, but it's pretty darn good. I mean, it, it runs, it does what it says it does. And so we're seeing a lot of people approach us on the and story, not an or story. They just say, hey, we have this. Can you interoperate with that? And so we put together a Kafka bridge. We'll open source it. It was just kind of a throw together POC for the, the meeting in New York. Um, but anything we do, uh, unless a client says it can't be open sourced, we will open source. I don't believe in freemium enterprise, open core models. I believe you have to make a business model that works with the fact that you make open source software that's all open and is extremely easy to use and does what it says it does. Um, I don't believe in holding stuff back, so. Um, so the question is, uh, broker messaging is what we were talking about versus brokerless. Um, yeah, so I get this question a lot. Um, you know, people say, oh, we, we want brokerless. And I said, okay, why? And, uh, you know, they have lots of different reasons. And I think some of them can kind of be maybe legitimate. Um, but I always say there is no direct line between you and something else, right? Uh, even if you're in a rack, you're going up through the top of the rack switch and you're coming back down, right? You're going through the network elements. So what we're trying to make the NAT server be is so extremely light and performant and you can have as many as you want all the way out to the edges that it's almost like a network element, meaning they exist, but you don't even know they exist there, right? Um, to answer your question directly, we have not heard of anything when people have come to us saying, please interoperate with this, whether it be zero MQ or whatever those things are. Um, I've had a couple people mention zero MQ. My big thing is uh, when Colin was talking about the accounts and uh, the metaphor of containers for your communication space, we literally can pick those up and move them anywhere. So the, the whole notion of subject-based addressing, which is what we do with PubSub, is, is that there is no ties to IPs, none whatsoever. If you're doing point-to-point, -point, right, someone has to tell you where that other endpoint is, and you have to connect to that thing, right, whether it's TCP IP or Unicast or whatever. And we believe the world is moving such that IPs are just simply a mechanism to do communication that should be treated as ephemeral. I grew up when it wasn't, you know, I walk into any bank in Wall Street and go, my stuff's running on that rack, down on that floor, you know. Uh, that just doesn't seem to exist anymore. And the more people 
fight against it, 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 it makes it harder and harder to design some of these newer systems, I, I think. So, like with NGS, we struggled with, um, you know, how do we mix the, the older world from the new world to bootstrap this? So we have a single DNS URL, right, that filters itself geographically and then it pins you to the cloud provider that you're coming from because it's a religious thing. You don't want to be coming from Google and be whacked into a, you know, Amazon or whatever. Um, but then, as you notice, the, the system itself is self-healing itself and gossiping to the clients where things are moving around. So we have this abstraction layer, even from DNS. So even as we're rolling up our, our own system and doing rolling updates, the clients are automatically informed of all the new set as the old set's going away. And if DNS hiccups, or you're in a hotel where the DNS cache says, eh, we'll do our own rules. We'll hold on to it for eight hours. Um, it won't matter, right? We're trying to be resilient against that as well. So is there any specific technology? I mean, there's some good ones for sure. I mean, I know a bunch of those people. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and I mean, to, to be honest with you, we, I, I truly do love our technology, but I also, if someone comes to me and says, well, we really love this, I'll say, no problem. You know, it's, it's good. And Zero MQ has some great people behind it. Um, yeah, I actually played around with, uh, didn't he also write Lib, uh, the one that does like Golang coroutines in C? Yeah, I think that's the same person that wrote Zero MQ wrote that. That was fun. Any others? Yes. No problem. Sure, so the question is, how does NATS fit into kind of the, the microservices talks around um, this conference and things like that? Um, I have a lot of opinions on that. Uh, for people who have embraced NATS um, and really looked at it as something that has three simple patterns, right? It has pub sub, request reply, and then load balancing where it's totally no configuration at all, right? It just it works. It just figures itself out they always seem to give us feedback of, wow, I can't believe I was stuck for so long doing HTTP, where I had to know the other endpoint, and then I had a sidecar, and then I had another sidecar for that sidecar, then we had to do security, so then we did this, and for TLS certs, and then, you know, next thing you know, you've got a PhD project just to do a communication thing between two things that might move. And we just don't think it should be that hard. I, I really don't. And so every time people are like, oh, well, you just need gRPC, you just need this. I always kind of give the same example. I said, okay, developer mindset usually is in request reply. I'm going to send a message to him. He's going to send me a message back. Even at that layer, Nats right, abstracts out where he is, where I am. If there's one of him, 10 of him, don't care. What's interesting to me is, is that people kind of forget a little bit about, okay, well, day two, when we go into production, what happens? Well, yeah, now all of a sudden I need to actually load balance him. So now we need to put a load balancer in, and we got to be doing TLS, and who has certs? And then Wally has to do governance and compliance, and how are we going to do that? Oh, well, we'll stick a log here, and then we're going to flip the log to Wally, and now Wally's five minutes behind, but we got to figure it out in 30 seconds or else we lose $10 million. And I'm going, just stop. Stick nets in. I mean, I, I really do believe that, and I believed it with just pub subsystems. Pub subsystem with nets. Colin never changes, I never change. Ops goes, wow, we're, we're slowing down. Let's crank up 10 more of him. Hey, we need compliance. Great. Let Wally come in. We've never even stopped. We've not been recombobbed, we've not been turned off. We just keep doing our own thing. I just think it's a, such a powerful pattern for our world that's getting more and more complex, right? Software systems will never be so simpler than they are today. And yet we're still using these tools that were like, hey, we've got this solution. And if you look at it, and maybe I'm biased, but if you look at it, it's like, we make this assumption at the very lowest level that we use HTTP to communicate with microservices. And then look how many layers up, especially in this conference, are being built to try to get around that limitation. And just makes no sense to me whatsoever. The security thing's hard. So we leaned in really hard to try to make this thing, I mean, forward-looking secure, where you get a high-level cryptographic person to come in and just try to beat the snot out of it and say, this is actually pretty good. And our developers still go, 
wow, I just had to add another thing saying user credentials to my connect line, that's it. We believe in that type of philosophy of trying to do things like that and not do sidecar after sidecar after operator after operator, see, or, you know, whatever that stuff is. So um, as you can tell, I have an opinion on that. I think Nats is great for microservices, but I'm also not gonna have people try to drink our Kool-Aid if they're like, we have everything we want with HTTP or whatever that is. So the question is, what about the additional services that the service mesh technologies offer? Um, I think there's, there's two um, that are really um, important. Um, authorization, dynamic and secure authorization, and like you said, monitoring. And so with the code that's in master now, um, it's not easy to find, but we're working on the docs. We were, we were wet painting it towards the end to get the GA with our, our product. Um, the system is actually tracking everything for you. And so inside of NGS now, you can just say, hey, I'm going to send a request to ngs.usage, and it'll come back and tell you how many messages sent, bytes sent, bytes received, bytes you know, done. And every user is almost kind of ephemeral. So in the old version of, of Nat's topologies, people were just, it was a free-for-all. Everyone could send anything and receive on anything. And what even our own team is starting to see now is, is that as we're moving and getting these functionalities as such that you know, a cluster now is driven by a trusted set of operators. The operators sign accounts. Accounts then sign for users. And then the users have those permissioning and they can be turned off instantaneously, globally, worldwide with, you know, click. That we're starting to get a feel for saying, ah, this is something that you can take from dev into production and feel safe, secure, it's locked down. If somebody roots that machine over there, they have credentials that can send to one subject on one account, right? And so that notion of accounts plus the user permissioning, I think, allows people to take the exact same code from dev where it might be totally open and you move into production and all of a sudden it's the code doesn't change but who i am my identity changes and all of a sudden it's totally locked down so we can get better at giving tooling to surface some of those technologies um, to make it easier for you to implement them I, I just don't think you need the 15 layer stack to just figure out how to communicate but i do believe in monitoring and and security and authorization so when we catch up on some sleep, I think we're going to start looking at what are the opportunities for service mesh if people want them. Like I said, I, you know, I, I'm too old to worry about people who are saying, well, I can do everything with HTTP. And I say, okay, no problem. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the question is, um, any conversations on distributed tracing, open tracing, Zipkin, that kind of thing? Um, we definitely have some uh, customers that have been talking to us and want that put in. Uh, philosophically, uh, I believe that the core system underneath the cover should treat payloads as opaque, um, meaning, you, you know, it's, think about it, our phones don't say you have to speak English or French or Italian when you pick them up, right? They're just transport or payload agnostic. Um, and the, the, so we're looking at it and we'll do it with envelopes. So you just do a layer of abstraction in, in your, your client uh, language of choice. Instead of a Nats publish, you'll do a my cool publish, which will just say put a sequence number on it. And we do it ourselves. So those system events that all the servers are sending out now, they put an envelope around that identifies themselves and the sequence number from that server so that endpoints, without having to do any type of crazy at least once, exactly once, can detect gaps, re-coordinate with each other. Um, Philosophically, I'm happy to figure out how to make you know customers happy. I've been doing these things for what 91, so what's that? You know, a long, long time. I've never used distributed chasing. I was at Google for six years. They said you can do it, you know, and I go, yeah, I, I don't want to. I don't need that. Um, I don't know if that means I'm just not smart enough to understand it, but it, it feels like it. It almost works against you, believe it or not. Um, but some people really love it, and we just say, yeah, we'll wrap it up in an envelope, no problem. With the envelopes, with the T-streams? Yeah. And with envelopes, we can actually T streams of data into logging so you can flip it on and off, and the client doesn't even have to know or do any changes whatsoever. That's the, the power of PubSub. Yeah, so I think we'll, 
we'll do something where if someone wants open tracing uh, compatible um, systems using our stuff, that, that'll work, right? Anybody else? Come on, you can get me on something. Okay, well, we'll hang out. Thank you guys so much. I really, especially at the end of the conference. I know everyone's tired, but uh, we really appreciate the users and stuff, and uh, the ecosystem is really important to us. So thank you. And again, if you have any other questions, we'll hang. Come on up and beat, beat me up. So 